So for our next trick, we have another consumer product for you. Um, but this one is a very different consumer product. Um, it's a pretty vast category, I would say, consumer products. Um, but it's it's another object that is uh, scanned um, with a probably a handheld scanner, um, something along the lines of this right here, or maybe an arm. I don't remember exactly which one uh, this one was utilizing, um, but you'll see here in a second. Um, this one is scanning a bottle. Um, so this people come up with these organic designs for all kinds of packaging and bottling. And then we have to create molds of those to mass produce them, right? And um, they change them all the time because refreshing the packaging helps appeal and all those other things, as many of you guys know. But here is the example of scanning one of those. And what I wanted to do is highlight, again, this is the theme that is following throughout this, uh, both of these applications that we're talking about today on the webinar, is... Here is another example where we approached the model two different ways. But instead of auto surface uh, feature based, we did feature based and uh, we did um, what I would call a boundary fit. So it's like a semi automatic surfacing fit uh, to the boundary fit. So that can save an awful lot of time. You see how this is a beautiful model where they use the boundary fit to quickly capture the shape and create a model out of it that fits you know, very precisely to the mesh. But yet it didn't take as much time as breaking down all the different shapes and fitting surfaces and stitching them together, which we will show here in a second. So let's go ahead and jump over to Design X to show this application. So here we are with our final bottle. And then here's the scan data there. And as usual, the with a feature-based model, there is some assumptions. There are assumptions that are made about the functionality and modeling it. So people model these slightly different, but it is so valuable to be able to roll back with the history tree and be able to take a look at how somebody approached modeling apart. So we'll go ahead and uh, you see here I rolled back and it looks like the first thing that this person did is create one big old block extrude and then they went ahead and cut the side away based on fitting. Actually it looks like one constant extrusion down that they went ahead and cut away that method there. Awesome. And then on this side, we'll see what they do here. It looks like they're creating a surface loft on this side surface. And we'll turn it on so we can actually see it there. There we go. It, it looks like they go ahead and extend it. Let's see what this is. It's like Christmas morning here. Okay, so then they went ahead and extruded that body there. And then let's go ahead and they went ahead and Boolean that away. So they're creating a tool here. And then they're going to use this to cut away from that piece as well. So we'll just... We'll just hide some solids here. So they use that to hide, to trim and create that. And then now it looks like they're going to go ahead and Boolean that away from the solid here to create that side shape. And then add a fillet. And probably a similar approach is going to happen on this side. Oh, so they went ahead and cut it all at once after they did an extend and a cut all at once. Let's see what they do over here. 
and they're going to do uh, fit a surface along the top and cut it away. So you see the approach they're taking here is uh, just kind of side by side by side, chunking it away. And then now we're going to apply some fillets. Create another tool, Boolean, cut the handle away. That's a neat approach. I like that. There's just lots of different ways. It's like a 3D puzzle is what I always say to people in class. It's like a 3D puzzle to try to figure out how you would go about creating that shape with all these tools that are in your toolbox of extrudes and revolves and locks and sweeps and all these different tools and how you order them and structure them in order to create the shape that you're looking to create. And then getting it to peek inside how somebody else would go about doing this. So you see that because there's that round shape, they're kind of chunking it out with solids. Like so. And then we'll fill it, fill it, fill it all over the place to smooth that out. And now it looks like we're going to work on the bottom. Neat. Looks like they're going to go all the way around with that same technique. Sweep, 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 boolean cut away on both sides, front, back, and then fill it in. Now, we'll just go up here. I wonder if they start up up top here yet. Okay. Oh, looks like they're uh, working on the bottom here. That's neat there. And then we go ahead and fill it that in. All the pieces in there. And as you can tell, they're doing one side and we're going to mirror it across. That's uh, kind of the plan here. Linear pattern. Those brace pieces there to add more rigidity to the bottom. Now... It looks like they're going to go ahead and create these these uh, swoopy shapes here by creating the pieces and then um, cutting them down by using this this tool piece up here and then adding adding fillets there to round them off. Very creative approach there. I like that. So yeah, use that, cut it from the top, fill it, the shapes, and then cut and mirror, and then let's just go to the end here, revolve the top, and then they also created the... Um, created a thread up there as well so there we have a beautiful hybrid model not hybrid model feature model of this um, jug here so now let's go ahead and drop over the boundary fit option so the boundary fit will roll back 
and you'll see much shorter workflow. So if I roll back, they roll forward. They went around this mesh, and I often, yep, that's what they did too. I'll just double check. So I went through and used my mesh tools. That's what I would do, and remove the holes and kind of shape this piece in a, you know, remove any defects from it before you go ahead and draw your curve network all over the shape of the entire piece, right? So they just went ahead and used tools to create this curve network. There's a bunch of different options here. You can uh, cut sections you, um, by drawing lines on screen. So you see that center line? You can do it this way, where you just draw a line down the center. And when you hit OK, it will create curve section through there. So you could do that down the middle and then come back with other tools to draw where you want your profiles to be afterwards. I didn't mean to click section again. I meant to click this. And then you can click and draw all over the surface and draw square patches. That's, that's the idea here is that you would draw square patches all over the surface of the part. And the software is going to fill these with NURB surfaces. And depending on how much detail, this, that's kind of how I approach this stuff. If I wanted very high detail, I would add more curves and more following lines like this, more edges, to create higher resolution along these flowy lines there. And then that would help create more fine resolution here. Uh, but you would just draw the entire curve network. You would trim them all together. Um, and once they're trimmed together, I'm going to not accept this. I come over to Boundary Fit. And you see now, I'm going to hide the mesh. We did a Boundary Fit. And you'll see it. It has the... It has the shape of the mesh in there. You can see like the texture of the mesh. Boundary Fit has a lot of options in here. So you can come in and I can hit next and I can reduce this maybe to 10 by 10 and add more smoothing. So hopefully we don't blow this up, but hit OK. And it's going to go through and reduce the resolution of the nerve surfaces and follow the mesh less, loose smooth it out a little more. I could also smooth the mesh before I use this tool. So another thing I could do is if that mesh has a texture to it, I could come into those same smoothing tools that we talked about before uh, where I run um, the processing tools like uh, global, uh, global remesh. And you see that it'll have a more fine, uh, smooth remesh there and then from there they went ahead and start work on your top your helix to create your spout up here and you are ready to rock and roll and pour a bunch of fabric softener or whatever detergent right here so a really neat application of using boundary fit. Yes, you could also turn that mesh on and auto surface it too. All right, so I could come over here and I could say auto surface and then organic maybe and hit a, hit apply and let it auto surface the entire shape. So just turn that back on and turn the mesh off you see there's my auto surface version as well so really neat application there where we used hybrid style approach using the boundary fit surface and boundary fit is over here in the menu add-ins legacy boundary fit which soon that will be added back over to the uh, regular interface as a regular tool to be used.
Um, so with that, let's go ahead and jump back over to the PowerPoint. As I stated before, Geomagic Design X Pro is part of a complete lineup of software that has three tiers of Go, Plus, and Pro. And again, the differentiators are that Pro, Pro has all the tools built in, Plus has uh, plugins and um, basic modeling tools, and Go primarily is focused on importing data with it has no plugins built in, but it brings in data from POI, OBJ, STL, all those different import formats. We have a huge library of formats that we bring in more than almost anybody out in the market um, and allows you to extract basic model information, send it over to CAD. So go extract basic model information, plus add plugins, add more modeling tools, pro, you get everything and you have the ability to upgrade from one to the other by trading in go trading in plus to get pro um, so it's a great um, ecosystem a great product lineup um, but we wanted to make sure that we point out that that pro is part of this lineup and there are other options available